start. So welcome to this discussion. Uh, I saw the title of the change, but it was I think, initially uh, racism, state racism, and migration and anti-racist organizing. Um, I guess just to introduce myself, my name is Anne Mulhall, and I am with the Anti-Racism Network. Um, just to say a little bit about the structure, I guess, of this session, we've got an hour and a half, and we've got some really excellent people contributing to the round table, so we're going to give that, I think, at least an hour for people to, to talk, because there's a lot to be said. And then after that, um, we'll have uh, an audience, to you know, everybody can join in the conversation. It's going to be a fairly unstructured discussion as well. Um, uh, I'm just going to frame it a little bit though first, just based on some conversations on Facebook and face to face about what we might kind of focus on during this discussion. I guess first of all, you know, this is taking place in Dublin and Ireland, but we're all very aware, I think, at the moment of just how much uh, a sort of this state racism and in particular the migration and deportation regime, how much those are not actually specific to this place, but are completely involved in the European and global uh, machinery, really, of um, continuing neo-colonial uh, division and exclusion. And I guess particularly what's on everybody's minds are the recent deaths of people trying to cross the Mediterranean to kind of breach the borders of Fortress Europe. Um, so I think we will be <laughs> speaking in that context and also in the context of really the accelerated rise of the far right in, in Europe uh, and in the EU. And not just in the context of kind of fringe uh, movements and organisations, but in the context of mainstream politics and mainstream media. And, um, and how does that impact on on, on organising as well. How does that impact on our movements? Now, related to those questions is the question of broader kind of political and social movements in Ireland. And to what extent issues around race and migration are actually included within those broader movements. So we could think in terms of the anti-austerity movement, we could think in terms of labour organising and trade unions. Uh, we could think also in terms of things like the abortion uh, uh, rights campaign, in terms of LGBTQ politics also. Okay, to what extent are those inclusive of issues of race and migration? And to what extent are uh, anti-racist, asylum seeker and migration and social justice movements inclusive also in terms of addressing issues of uh, queer specificity or issues of gender uh, within, within the issues that impact on, on people of colour and on migrants. Um, other issues that we thought we might talk about, uh, one that's kind of been talked about a lot within the asylum seeker movement is the NGO's in NGOization of anti-racist and migration justice and asylum seeker organising. Okay, so uh, this is something that particularly affects anti-racist and uh, the anti-racist movement and the migration justice movement in Ireland. Okay, that it is a field that has been very much dominated by NGOs. What impact does that have on the ability of self-organising, say, among asylum seekers? Uh, what impact does it have on the um, capacity for a really radical kind of movement, okay, a revolutionary movement within anti-racist and migration movements for social justice here. And connected to that, I think, is to what extent is the movement as it's developing in Ireland connected to a broader European and global movement? How do we build our movements? Okay? How do we make those connections uh, outside of the Irish context as well? Those were some issues that came up during the discussion um, that we might talk about or return to. There were other issues as well. I think issues around the connections between labour organising and migrant labour. Okay, where, where are those in terms of broader trade union and labour organising in Ireland? Specific issues that affect people who are uh, 
migrate, who have migrated here and who are either excluded from the possibility of, you know, legitimate work or um, legal work, or uh, and people who are actually really exploited in uh, because of their visa requirements. So I'm just going to ask each person here to introduce themselves and maybe say a little bit about the <coughs> work or organisations that you're involved in. So I regret sitting inside your <laughs> First thing to uh, my name is Andy Bardoon. I'm a um, gay Irish traveller. I'm kind of mostly involved with the ITM as well as SG Pavi, which is um, kind of a, a European domain of SG Pavi to Roma. So it's trying to create a platform for SG nomads, either Irish traveller or, or Romanese or kind of Sinti, in order actually to I suppose, carve out a voice within the communities and for all, not only for, I suppose, for the tours of identity and kind of protection but also towards it and kind of adjusting of policies that are very kind of heteronormative. And um, I've been involved kind of that kind of process um, since 2009. And um, I'm very excited to be here, especially as it's, it's, it's a wider dialogue. That I think that, especially for myself, being a kind of um, defined as Irish and Irish travellers, it's very easy just to, to over-localise it within either the country. As I see that there is quite a strong commonality of processes that are applied throughout our kind of um, our society at large and um, so I'm looking forward to this and kind of I'm quite happy how it's an open circle it's very organic and kind of not so it's not so overly prescriptive so um, thanks everybody okay uh, my name is Abby um, I'm a student here in Ireland and also an immigrant I wasn't born here um, I guess I'm here really to just I mean have a conversation with people. I didn't really. Uh, what am I involved with? I'm a student at the moment, but I'm also an anarchist. So I was with the WSM, and I have a tour in the air and sort of kind of. Um, so I mean, when you say work, I mean my work at the moment is my college work. <laughs> but um, so for me, I'm just here to kind of like have a conversation, learn from everyone here, and also give my point of view, my perspective from things I've learned over the past few years that I've been have left and. Hopefully, just have a space for a conversation that everyone's comfortable with, and we'll all learn. Um, my name is Farah Mokhtar Um I, I guess in this context, I can say it's the first time I've ever said is like I'm a second generation migrant. And my family came from Iran to the United States um, in 1979, and then throughout the 80s during the Iran Iraq War. Um, and my father married my mother, who's American woman and um, got divorced really quickly <laughs> uh, after I was born so I kind of grew up between like two very different worlds in my family um, in, in my father's side most of my um, most of my family didn't speak English as their first language and, and they um, actually spoke two different languages as a household language so it was like brought up in a space where um, where English wasn't the first language and where people faced precarity often um, in trying to live in the United States, not speaking the language, not having the right um, documents, um, and then going to my, uh, over to my mother's side, who, um, who had like, very racist yeah. ideas of Muslims and, and having to hear that all growing up. Um, so, so I think just from that perspective, that's where I started. my activism started, and then from, from like, a young age kind of being brought up that way, I, I started making some connections more widely and began to work in, in the anti-war movement because um, September 11th happened um, when I was 17 and, um, and that really politicized me um, and then I went to work in, in the Middle East for a long time um, in different um, international solidarity kind of projects. Um, and eventually, and, and that brought me to Ireland originally, um, participating in the um, pit stop plowshares group that had hammered on the plane, and, and Shannon and I came over as a witness in their trial, and that's how I kind of originally got to Ireland, and now I'm um, a student um, writing about women's rights movements in the Middle East, um, and also part of Anti-Racism Network, and also in the WSM, and also in so many different <laughs> campaigns, the water campaign and everything, and trying to really bring a voice of inclusion into all the spaces that I yeah, uh, my name is Luke Booker. I'm involved with Antrasis Network. Uh, when I was told about this, this discussion, the main thing was like how it has really bring in um, 
most of the issues that most of us is, uh, is immigrants face. Normally, we discuss this topic separately, racism in its own, or students' visa in its own, or asylum seeking, that provision. But to have like all the people with so wide, you know, issues that um, I wouldn't call it that we are minority, but things which are always looked, I mean, separately or being seen as other issues, the LGBT and other issues that 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 we face all together not being in the mainstream or being accepted, I thought it would be a good platform that if you come and share. I wouldn't think that I know so much about it, but by sitting together here together, we'll be able to come up with maybe after this discussion with ways on how we can really have uh, or a model or a way of how we could be able to participate in to formulate the society that we really want to live. At, uh, last Thursday, there was a video about people dying in the Mediterranean. And months ago, there was other protests about people who are being kept in uh, prison-like situation in direct provision here is asylum seekers. And we have issues about people being taken out of homes with people who have found some unoccupied uh, places which they made themselves as home, they've been taken away, and we have others who are remo uh, refusing to get out of a mansion which is worth more, but they're still in it. So these issues, if we do try to see, to live together. Uh, for myself, it's the issue of organizing. I really, really hope that uh, we have so many people who are really brilliant with good consciousness and brave, but they act as individuals. But I think that sometimes I know it's hard to find organization which is perfect for you, but it's always important to be part of a sort of organization so that if we do this together, no matter what organization it will be, but bring all this, we'll be able to learn more from each other, from our day to day. Some of the things people see is some theories and that it is the lives some yeah. and most of us have been living or we are still living in. So it is good to have this platform to be able to discuss. I was born in Zimbabwe, so <laughs> I would say that. And um, I've been an activist uh, since being a student in Zimbabwe. So by the time I came here, it was, I just saw it as natural that instead of mourning and complaining on how things are, the best thing was is to participate and get involved. So it, there are so many organizations which are out there. So it is something that I think during the discussion, we have to encourage each other to participate and to really, really try to, to do something. It's easier now with the, with the social media to, to think that we are doing enough, but it's also more enough if we organize even our friends and our relations to really make them understand how painful it is sometimes for some of us who might be seen as minority, you know, or how it will be. So it will be a choice for everyone to try to move back. So that will be the part of what I look forward to contribute. Thank you. My name is Lucky Samule. I am from Cork, and uh, I live in the direct provision uh, at a centre they called Kinsale Road Accommodation Centre. And our organisation, as a community, is called CRAC Asylum Today. It's an organisation that we formed as asylum seekers. Uh, to stand up to the system that we saw uh, that is uh, depriving us of uh, any movement or any identity that we feel that it has just been stolen by the system, by the government for years. And uh, hence we organized a protest last year of uh, uh, locking up the staff and the management so that we can say what we wanted to say and demand what we wanted to demand and uh, to create the awareness of what is happening actually 
at, with the direct provision because the direct provision is a system whereby the government decides that these type these uh, communities uh, of uh, asylum seekers must be separated from the rest of the people, and uh, this is what we are uh, we are saying. We are still saying we cannot be separate from the people. We are, we, are, we, we are the same. We are all equal. We are the same. We want to be integrated. So the reason why we come to such meetings is, is to create that awareness as well from, from these organizations and to support what my brother was saying uh, just now. Uh, so many organizations, but if one, uh, you know, there's no, there's no much uh, impact if you try and say what you want to say on your own. But if we join our heads and join our efforts together, because racism everywhere that we go is racism. Whether you are, we are, you are at a level of whereby you are working, there is racism. Whether you are not working, there is racism. In the organizations that you are, there is racism. So there's one common thing that is joining us uh, together today, and of which I think we can really uh, find a way to work together and uh, create this awareness and make people aware. Some people don't realize that there is racism that is happening within the sphere that a person is working on. And until that is realized, that is when you're going to be able to address the racism because it comes from above and it's very, it's very difficult to deal with it at the bottom when the, when, when the top is, is uh, that is what is called, we call state racism, when the top is, is, is not doing what it's supposed to do, uh, then we cannot be able to deal with the bottom. So we are here today that we can share and uh, learn from each other, uh, mm -hmm. and that's it. Can I just yes. say, since we'll kick off the round table a bit with the round table, <laughs> no, but I, but in terms of what you were just saying, I was really struck and this morning coming um, here on the Lewis, um, when I saw one of the Yes campaign posters, and I everybody should vote yes, um, but it just, it says like everybody should be treated equally, and then there's like a picture of like people of all different races and ages and stuff like that, and I was like, on one level, yes, like, um, on another level, like, I was just thinking about like how long, it, like how much work and how long it would take before like we start to think about migrants as deserving of equality in that same way in terms of like everybody should treat, be treated equally so vote yes but that's like yes I think you should vote yes and like um, there's just seems to be such like a sort of a block or something when you know I feel like in terms of migrants I'd be amongst the most privileged but myself faced like horrible situation not being able to work um, and being iced out of social welfare, like if I applied for social welfare, I, I, my visa would get cancelled. Um, other people in direct provision, like you know, um, separated from the rest of society. Like our society isn't equal, and, and voting yes, although I think everybody should, won't mean that our society is equal at all. Um, and um, and you know that's a real that's a real issue. And in terms of like my own. My own work and, and some of um, what I do in terms of solidarity in the Middle East, I, I was thinking about today, like a lot of the NGOs and even people would really support the Arab Spring and the Free Movement and send money like, to, for organizations doing gender work in the Middle East and stuff like that. And on one level, people like really support and, um, you know, superficially support these democracy movements in the Middle East, except for if you if one of those people wants to come to Europe, and then you're fucked. Like, sorry, sorry. But you know, and I have a, I have a, a friend, a dear friend of mine, who is Iranian um, women's rights activist, um, uh, and an activist in LGBT rights organizing in, in Iran, and um, and had and because of their work, were was put into Evan prison and was on death row. Um, and was able to, to, to
to leave Iran and come to Ireland, where she was immediately put into direct provision for five and a half years. Um, and you know, I asked her to come and speak on this panel, and it's still too painful for her to really even be able to speak. And we talked about how, like, um, how you know, governments legalized their own migration to the Middle East through occupation, you know, of the place, but then people at the bottom. Um, of, of globalization, you know, try to come here and we're criminalized just for, for migrating or face all kinds of issues just trying to live our, live our lives. So I'm sorry to bring in so many different issues in one, but like, <laughs> I was just really struck by the equality posters and how it's, it seems so radical to say that migrants should have equality. Um, I, I kind of um, come from a different kind of angle. I think at times that the, there's a lot of tense around for what we understand to be equality. Um, I, I don't think equality is, is in any way enough. People should not just be held as equal, it should actually be celebrated. Because especially from kind of someone from a nomadic background, equality in Ireland means that you have to be settled. You have to live within these certain rules rather than actually a, a act, acts of celebration and your own sense of identity. So kind of why we can strive at times for equality, I think a lot of times that it's, we, we're feeding into a system that will abuse it because it, it, it draws it down to fundamental principles of law and one of my kind of ongoing things is that the lack of sanctions in this country around communities, it's only the powerful that sanction the minorities. It, it, when we reverse the kind of there's no way to apply sanctions and it's incredibly, it's incredibly disempowering at times and very, very frustrating. And I, 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 I will, of course, be voting yes, but I think that sometimes people say the message of going, equality is important, equality is important, of course it's important, but that's not the bottom line, because equality will strip you of your sense of identity. It will strip you of your own ability to change and diversify and carve your own path, because it means the same at all times. Mm -hmm. and not only do we need to be equal, we need to be celebrated. I mean, actually, not only in our own personal differences, but other people's as well. And I know it's a bit of a rant, but mm -hmm. something I'm very kind of, um, passionate about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to say that. I mean, like, um, when it comes to equality, sometimes you can see that people they see equality in the way that it is given by the dominant ideas, especially mm -hmm. if it is every time given by uh, the, the television, like when you are sitting in the house seeing TV and the famous people or those celebrities are giving us all the time. That would be what is really taken in as that is the normal. That's how we should be. We should be um, uh, living as a society. That's why I, th I think that um, uh, by participating in the radical organization, social movement is very important because we have to try to link in every little struggle with other struggles, so that people could see yeah. how it link up. Mm -hmm. Even when people are fighting for right to water and that, mm -hmm. this also needs to bring the issues other, like uh, the minorities are also facing in how the state as a system facilitates to put those layers which are all, are all separate. So as um, an as activist of which I think that for most of us to come here somewhere, but somewhere, I, I think that uh, activism it should be a way or a method of trying to upset the consensus, the way that people think that this is a common sense or this is how it should, it should, it should be. We should be able to really try to, to broaden that uh, uh, awareness for, for people. Because so, sometimes you can see that people will be comfortable, let's say, to support uh, uh, what is happening in, in a far away country, but when it, when it comes here, same situation, they are indifferent. And yeah, you ask yeah. them, but why can't you do it here? They say, but it's, they will tell you it's different. So that term, instead of us even denouncing, uh, let's say, equality, we should try to own it and redefine it in a way. Um, that could be on other platform, but I know that's that could sound more challenging or more impossible, but it is more important for us to always challenge the common sense of common sense views of the society. And what there's so much what I call like a, 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 if you're talking about a, organizations, especially non-governmental organizations, they try to have a consensus, <coughs> the views which will 
so that the power will see them as the legitimate voice. So by doing that, they end up like diluting the real, the real movement and uh, demands, so that they will get something as a, as a representation of of the people. So if we have. Um, um, if we are organized on our own, especially like on the vote of equality, which is very important now, as we are talking with some of our colleagues, that we need to really be uh, proactive on that campaign as, as, as well. We know that it will, for some of us it will be difficult to, to say, oh, marriage is that thing, that's what we want, but it is something that we can also engage as we encourage people also to, to vote mm -hmm. for yes. So challenging the consensus is very important and also upsetting the common sense of, of, the, of the society, especially when they take over some words which meant to mean something which is more humane and end up making them less valuable only for, for their own good. You know, mm -hmm. That is not acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Jen, you know, one, I'm, I've been big involved in the water and before that the household tax, but especially I've noticed in terms of the, uh, in terms of the water tax protests, you know, it can be sometimes difficult being a migrant on those protests mm -hmm. because there's, um, you know, they're like the main slogan of the, of the campaign is like Irish water for the Irish nation. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's, it's I, I, you know, obviously I, you support those protests, yeah. but it should be water for, for everyone. But I think on another level, it's like recognizing um, how there's like how that's a certain privileged sort of conver I call it white privilege conversation within the left um, in a lot of these movements, and and how that can affect different people. And like again, in the equality, you know, what does equality mean? And I I really like your point about celebrating diversity, but that happens, you know. In a lot of campaigns, and um, and just to say briefly, like um, one is like they they I don't know if people know, but they put up the fees for students to stay in in, in Ireland, um, and I think they put up the fees for all kinds of migrants, but but they doubled the fees for us in 2012, um, uh, from 150 to 300 euro at base, and some people have to pay 450 euro, and there's never like um. A, a campaign against that, that kind of austerity tax, which is an austerity tax against really vulnerable people who literally can't like vote or protest it. Uh, you know, um, we can protest it obviously, but like at, you know only within a certain level where we, we can't get arrested. Um, but that's not not seen. You know, there's not a campaign around that. Um, but also because um, I, I was also involved in lots of protests around job bridge, and it's like one thing that I had to say. I hate job bridge. I think it. It's a terrible scheme. I think it, you know, drives down working conditions and wages for everyone. But it also completely ices out um, any any visa people who need visas in this country from <coughs> from internships, from you know, getting their foot in the door anywhere. And so, like for me, um, you know, I'm doing a PhD in Trinity now, and mostly the work that I've been able to get is in cafes, which is which is fine on a level, but like that's where my work experience is now because I'm not able to get an internship because I'm not able to go on social welfare. So although I don't encourage people going on job bridge in the first place, it also creates a two-tiered system between people who can go on social welfare and get their foot in the door and have a certain kind of job experience and then people like me who I feel like I'll finish and I don't see any future <laughs> in doing anything. Um, in terms of my field of work, um, because I, I won't have any job experience because I've been iced out of getting. It. So that's why I think we need to bring in these kinds of conversations, as you're saying, into our movements and, and into you know the way that we narrate them and envision them to include people. I'm like, just, like just, just wondering, Abby, I don't put you on the spot, but just yeah. as somebody who's a student in Ireland as well, I mean, you probably have. Obviously, a lot of personal experience with sort of issues. Of yeah, I mean, like Farah as well. Um, I mean, I got my citizenship recently. But, um, yeah. So, <laughs> 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 well, I mean, like, I'm just going to be you. But even then, I mean, God, I, I don't know even know how much it even costs. And then you have, like, the families who have to pay that. Like, it's like, oh God, like it's like a grand or something. And then I remember I didn't eat that one. <laughs> really, you know, and then, but even before that, you know, you had to, when in my era, you know, I couldn't, I didn't have free fees, so that was another thing, so I had to, like, we had to, you know, figure that out, and, um, and 
And I remember that was the time I also joined FEE, actually. That was what helped me become more radicalized, because that was happening in mm -hmm. Galway. And I remember my first instinct was, oh, I can't join FEE. I'm not Irish, and mm -hmm. you know, I don't even have free fees. What am I fighting for here? <laughs> even if they get free fees, I still won't get free fees. <laughs> so I had to like learn to just, and that, that was my learning point where I realized that actually I do actually have a right to yell along, along with the students and say, you know, free fees, we all deserve free fees. And, um, even the migrants, and then don't even get me started on asylum seekers. We can't even, even now, we can't even get into college, even though it's, it's changed now. And if you're a resident, you can actually get free fees. But then again, you have asylum seekers who can't. So, I guess as a student, um, just so much. Or stuff anything, about, you don't have like, to stick to that. I know, I know. <laughs> but um, for me now, I guess my biggest issue, I guess, is. Um, because my um is watching my mom because she is obviously because I'm kind of lucky because of my degree that I have before you know that actually counts for something here but she came and they don't care if you if it says like um, Nigeria on your CV it doesn't matter even if you can so for her it's I you know she's just so strong and I, I hate saying strong black women because they always say but she is you know and um, for her you know for her she just wakes up and she know and like she knows that if she was back in Nigeria and things are shit in Nigeria but she knows that if she was back there things would be a bit better in some way. So for her when she's here, her it's her issue her, her issue is my issue and for her it's waking up each day knowing that like she's here for us but she knows that the powers that be mean that even though she's worked for this it doesn't matter at all. And that affects each and every one of us. My dad's not here because he's back in Nigeria because again his C V didn't matter at all. So he's back there. So we're here, and she's pretty much a single parent. And you know, that's every that's a lot of people's stories here in Ireland. They're pretty much single parents because one of them has to go back to Nigeria, or they, they might have to go back to Nigeria if they can, you know, or if they even have homes to go back to. And that's why every time I see someone who's like <coughs> an obvious immigrant and you're cleaning bathrooms already, I just love them. I just say hi, good morning, how's your day, you know, and you just talk to them because I know that they're just so badass because they wake up each day and they just, you know, and just get stuff done and I ran through a bit there but mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah that's kind of stuff I'm kind of looking at mm -hmm. so. yeah. yeah, no, no, I just want to think about students <laughs> you know, what has happened in the past year, past year has been very it has caused so much stress and uh, confusion among international students and what is more strange it is some colleges are closing like closing down, whereas that very week they were taking fees from students, and that fees is not like little money. You know, so many students are paying up I mean, over 3,000 for only getting a visa for one year, whereas they are not even allowed to work for, for more hours. I think they want to work for a, you know, I mean, a 20 hours, is it? Yeah. And, um, and uh, they are expected to pay all that money. And this college is now, at the moment, I think there are only five which are still operating. And uh, from what I've seen from, especially some from Southern Africa students, the choice that they were left with, it is something I've seen which is complementing to the, to the government um, a plan of job bridge, where people are able to work to next to nothing. Mm -hmm. Because these students, most of them are doing some of the jobs that you could not really believe in. There's so much abuse in it. Some are not even being paid. Because they work for for some uh, some uh, agents. It could, it could be in the cleaning, like in, in the buildings, could be like um, um, babysitting and other things that are, are they don't have so much um, some, some way to re to re go and complain. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some real like issues, especially on the issue of abuse and not being paid as, as, they, have, uh, as they have been promised and working so much long hours. Whereas their fees are being taken by this by these colleges. Uh, like the last meeting which was done two weeks ago, where the, uh, the, there's this organization, international students and. Um, Organization, which is which is the one the, the state always refer every student, even if their fees is paid, because most of them they need the, the college so that their visa will be renewed. 
but the immigration department always asked them to go to that student body to get a letter. And that board, you can see, in my opinion, is just toothless. It's just like an, an extension of a government department in the way it really operated. Because by this time, this issue about colleges could have been addressed or not be able to take money, even if they take money to be seen as a criminal offense and not the way it is being done now. And the, the ICOS and ICOS. the ICOS gets like, like eighty percent of their funding from the government to run these like schemes, bringing people over from Africa and who want to do who want to do um, master's degrees, but like that's the student, that's like the main student NGO, um, and you know like I just think that they have they've been kind of like overwhelmed with work because of all the closing, but I just think there's a real conflict of interest there. Um, Yeah. Just take away a fun thought, um, if, if, uh, I suppose, from my earlier, is that something I find in my own life, which is very personal, but um, privilege brings a lot of silence for, for us. Yeah. I think that we're all very involved in our own struggles because they're the ones we deal with absolutely every day, and they're the ones that we, we have the passion for to t turn up going, we need this change, we need to kind of evolve beyond this. And, and then, very recently, someone actually asked me, what are my actual privileges? And I am incredibly privileged in this society, despite all of the issues against kind of standing against me. And they're the ones I'm most silent on. You know, and they're the, they're the ones that we, we kind of step back from other people because they're not exactly seen as our issues, but they're fundamentally associated with our issues because it's that lack of motivation, it's that lack of solidarity with people that um, actually creates those voids that where this kind of, I suppose, socialistic disease is, is born from. And I think there's something we can actually do is, where are you privileged in your life? And you're actually involved in actually, not actually, I suppose, extending that privilege to people, but nullifying it. Because I know that we're all actually focusing on our struggles because they're very important, but also that our privileges as well, because by holding them as privileges, we're denying them to other people. And I think that's something that it kind of, that it is tiring and it's incredibly difficult. And I know for myself, it's time that I, I would have denied having kind of benefits from other people's miseries, but I do. And I think that's something that kind of we all need to hold ourselves to high responsibility over, because these issues are flung to us all. And kind of, it's very easy to, I even myself here, kind of not being an, an immigrant, especially on this kind of panel, and it's very easy to kind of go, someone else's issue, you know? And regarding the going that my freedom has in itself limited yours, you know? And I think that's, that's something we need to actually look at in our own lives, and not just in some big days, but on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. And I just think that about solidarity, that way to be a viewed it, I mean, uh, yours, it's very like important in this time, especially like the struggles that the black and others have been like doing, especially to be able as asylum seekers to organize on themselves without um, uh, uh, state blessing or non governmental mm -hmm. and, and expertise mm -hmm. on how, how to do that. It, 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 is, it is something that I think for the better of our community in the other year, I mean, in the coming years, it's important to encourage that type of uh, bravery. You know, it's easy for us to see some nice written poster or flyer done by experts, consultants, talking about an issue and we think that is, that is, that is, that is the issue. And then forgot the people who are really doing that. So, our solidarity and support, we, we also need to critique, to question, and, all, and, and to use our, our, our voice is if we are privileged, to check if that is, because in every struggle, the, the contradiction, not everyone will be in that. We have to, to, to lose it. As we have seen that even on the equality vote, that some other uh, people who are saying, oh, I'm gay, but I'm against to, uh, to vote, I'm against anything, is this uh, uh, this famous blogger, you know? It's always been like the mouthpiece of the uh, TV3 and the RT1. They like him so much, you know? But we we have to be able to question. Uh, uh, so on the issue of direct provision, it is on the end game now. The government has no choice. They, they have to do something. But without really 
uh, supporting what the people who are living there are saying and follow what the people who manage and to look after them are saying, that would be total wrong. Because other they've got access. Even if they say one thing, it's in the media, it's everywhere. Whereas other people, they don't have the same means and access to, uh, to do that. Yeah. Just, just, just to add, uh, the, the sorry part about uh, the, the direct provision is sometimes uh, there are sectors that, that will, that will uh, 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 be brave or say, okay, direct provision has been in existence for 16 years and that must be celebrated. So we have seen in the past, last month, uh, in the media, celebrating, uh, I think uh, it was the junior minister celebrating the being proud of the 16 years of direct provision. And uh, one thing that struck us is what's there to celebrate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So many years, so many years of people's lives have been stolen, so and you can come and you, you remind the people that it's been 16 years. So it, 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 it is something that we, we, ju we just cannot stomach. There, there is a, 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 a boy uh, uh, next month on the 13th of May is going to celebrate his 10th year. It is 10th year. And all his 10 years, he has been in direct provision. 10 years full. He's going to be celebrating he has been in direct provision and uh, when you get organizations that are uh, seen to be the mouthpiece of the asylum seekers and and want to be up uh, front and the asylum seekers must follow in the I mean, uh, this existed because of that has been happening throughout the years mm. people have been uh, be up, up front. This is I, I, I'm, I'm advocating for for the migrants, asylum seekers, and, 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 everything, and everything. And you 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 do not articulate exactly what the asylum seekers want. You say what you think they want. You know. Yeah. Like for instance, the issue of the of of the working group that you, some of you or most of you would know. Uh, when it started, we as asylum seekers said no if we are not part of it mm -hmm. let it not carry on if we are not part of you know and uh, we we did whatever we could to create the awareness to write to 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 to, 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 to the to, to, to the minister to say what we wanted to say and uh, we know we all know that never happened and whatever report that will come we don't know what's gonna what's gonna be, and we don't. There's some of us that can see what is happening. We don't believe that that there's, that there's anything that will come that will benefit us. They leak information to the press before they they, they even come uh, 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 with that report. So that is disturbing to us when uh, information we get calls from 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 the, our fellow asylum centers and other centers to say, did you see this on paper? What does it mean? You know, it's it creating the confusion and it it depressing people more and creating false hope to the people, but they don't realize how it, that hap uh, what it does to the people that are really affected with that. Mm -hmm. Because people, a person will write or will say something, he goes back to, to his, uh, King bedroom uh, bed and still sleep and, and go to work and the asylum seeker will 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 be sleeping in that one room three four people one single bed uh, and that life just goes on person is not allowed to work is not allowed to to do anything actually you cannot study you cannot you are disskilled it doesn't matter what you have done before as as uh, he was just saying a, a useless CV uh, uh, for the mother and father. So it's just like that. And, and when people go
where we'll say we want to reform it. What can you, if I am living in the direct provision, and you ask, you ask me what, what is it that I can do to, to, to make things better in this, the first thing that you will get from, from me or somebody, get me out of here. Finish. Get me out of here. Don't improve anything. There is nothing that you can improve if my life is still in, in, this, in this box. And you, you find people carry on, carry on, carry on, and, uh, and say that is right. We are saying that that is not right. That is why these, these organizations like this are helping to sing in one voice and say, away with this type of provision. You said it's 16 years. So how many years now if you reform? Another 16 years? A lot of people that have been fortunately granted citizenship or, or papers to remain cannot get work. They are the burden of the state on living under social because there is nothing else they can do. They have not been helped so that they can be able to do whatever they want to do. After 10 years, do you still have a zeal to go and, 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 and register on anything? How long will it take you for, to keep up with the work in terms of uh, academically? That is what is happening with direct provision. And uh, that is why we are saying, we, 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 we are not scared to say, stop it, end it, finish, and the groups like this, these meetings, assist when we say there's an action that we need to take in order to create that awareness. There is a big group like this or more, like what has happened with the water. And it, 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 the voice is, is, is louder. Imagine when a lot of people are sitting outside the door there and uh, shouting to the minister or the, to, to, to the prime minister or to the junior minister when he, he, he looks through the window, because he won't come out anyway, he looks through the window and he can see the message. That is what is important. Yeah. It's action, action, action. Yeah, I'm just going to say, um, just like you said, um, it's good to listen to the voices as well. And like, obviously, when we say there's an action, please join us, that would be great. But I also like to think that if people also have their own ideas, you don't have to be part of the community, but if you have your own, something that you feel like you'd like to do to help as well, don't just, oh, should, should I, should I not, is it okay, you know, oh, oh I'm white, I might not get it right or something, I don't know. Like, because I've seen that happen, oh, can I do this? I, I would like to do this, but, and then you just, and then nothing gets done, I and mean, it's okay think of great ideas. I mean, it's not just going to come from one person. It's not just Luke, you know, and it's not just everyone. And we'd love for you to have great ideas and then and, and have a vision. And then obviously talk to people about it or else, you know, and have input from people involved. But, do, you know, everyone do it themselves. Don't just wait for the other people who are involved themselves to tell you what to do, but leave it alone with them. I think yeah. that's important. No, you're right. That is why we, we decided to take, to take steps that we, we, we decided to take because uh, throughout the years people, the, the, the system has, has, has been designed to, to, to say okay we must be grateful okay yes. we must be grateful because why are they complaining they can still eat they don't have bills to pay yeah. that is not the way of life you know we can we that, that is what we said we cannot a person that says one of the reports, uh, it even came to court when there was a court case uh, last year. Uh, a lady and, and a child from Galway challenging the, the court on, on direct provision. One of the witnesses came from Ria, and Ria said, he is surprised even the, the case to be uh, brought to court. He would think that the person is, would be grateful because he's got a, a sea view uh, hotel. He's got a sea view. He's got uh, this heating and this and that and that. He's supposed to be grateful. How can you be grateful having stolen six, seven, ten years of a person's life and you keep, still keep quiet? So that is what has been wrong before. That people 
have been made to, 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 to conform with that. Yeah. Let, it, let it be, it's okay. And then you wait, you wait, you wait, the years go, nothing is happening. <coughs> you, have, you fear that you're going to be deported. You know, people don't want to talk because they think, hey, you, the next thing I'm going to get the knock. The direct provision is designed for the people, they can be locked so that they can be found. Mm -hmm. They yeah. can be found yeah. at any time and be deported at any time they want to deport. Mm -hmm. That is why the retirement provision is there. That is why they want to reform, I mean, to reform it, so that they can still see where the people are. Mm -hmm. So that is why we say, let each and every opportunity that is there, we say no to this, to this mm -hmm. system. Yeah. And, and yeah, I, oh, it's <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 think, I, I think that the issue of, of direct provision at, at the moment, it should be one of the topical issues because what is really happening like uh, last month, every week there were two, three articles in the media, Irish Times, Irish Independent, yeah. that was not absent because the pressure was being there that the working group was being discredited. And the, the state and, I mean, senior civil servants and some of the people in the uh, land government organization, the only <coughs> thing they could have to do to redeem themselves and put themselves in people and do something was to leak all those, or uh, people in DP will be allowed to go to, 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 uh, uh, to third level education. Mm -hmm. So it means you, you still plan to lock them. Mm -hmm. You see, you, you, you still plan to make a long term locking them because if it is not there, you won't have all those plans. So the media was being used to test the, the water. And the yeah. type of language which was used was of trying to, to silence the radical voice of people who want a direct provision to be dismantled. Yeah. Because there's no room for it to be improved. It has been there long enough. And every report, internal and external from other bodies, they've said it's not fit for the purpose. But some, uh, I, do, I don't know, is it has to do with professionalization of non-governmental organizations or what? But it was also uh, good to see a very senior member resigning out of that, that board, the, the Chief Executive Officer of Irish Refugee Council. Her, her resignation, I think, was very, very important and significant, although I think she was the wrong person to resign because she might be one of the radicals we done there. I mean, given the other people who were, who were sitting there, she might be the person who could have tried to get like, but I think there's two more which would be done, especially like uh, the groups like CAC, where uh, Lucky and the team in other centers. If they are doing any action, it is important to you really support that and not believe the hype. The media, what it gives, it's always on the side of the power and try to weaken uh, the people. Because for the past, the past 10 years, anyone who has seen try to organize the people like and the others are doing, they were either punished by being transferred or being isolated in other places or being seen as troublemakers or being threatened time after time with, with deportation. Or on the other hand, they were being, after being broken down by the system, they were co-opted and be used as, as the mouthpiece of the government program through some yeah. non-governmental organizations. Yeah. Yeah. That has been happening. Yeah. So upon like a, a, ourselves as people who support and uh, in our communities, it's very important to you see even what as asylum seeker, who is, is, is say, I mean asylum seeker, what is say, is it in the good of the whole asylum seekers, or it could be good only for an individual, mm. or because that talk of all those with five years will be given, what about the one with two years? Yeah. With, so all of them, that divide in putting layers mm. and try to make other more deserving than the other, is just meant to divide the voice and the struggle yeah. to weaken it up. And as if we are not really seeing that, and we are more concerned about, but well, it's real sad that someone spent ten years, even three years. It's a, it's a prison sentence, even for some serious crimes here. You know, imagine someone who has just come to look 
uh, uh, to to have, I mean, to to to, to start a life is just being locked in in such a, a way, whereby most of the skills that are there now you can't even spend one year without waking or up, what do you call a a a policy. The technology is changing so rapidly and, and all that. So it is, I'm, I'm, I'm just going back that he, the self-organization of uh, 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 people who are fighting is very important to be supported. And also it's good to be critique even when we are supporting them yeah. than only looking to support those which are really squeak clean because they have machinery, they've got consultants, they've got so much money which is sponsoring this, some of the non-governmental organizations to put an image of caring whilst in the same way they have been there for the past 16 years. You know, so we need to really make sure that uh, when the next call of action or participating in either form or shape, we have to be there and question the right questions. And also, I mean, and, and, and support it. And when the major non government organization, because we should not just ignore them, they provide good services. And those services are needed as well. But what, when they are calling for action as well, we should be supporting, but we have to ask, where does it take it? And is it for the long or is it for short? So that people will know that we're not just taking information without really, um, um, questioning or asking, ask, asking what is really happening. Mm -hmm. But it's very important to make sure that those who are radical within a, a direct provision in other groups are not isolated because uh, we have a tendency to support those who are more flamboyant and they've got every resources on their side. In this, on the, in this issue, that's, what, that's what's happened. Um, yeah, and I think like for me, and maybe we could go to questions too, but just pushing a little bit more is like, um, you know, watching, watching, unfortunately, what's going on um, in terms of the border and the Mediterranean, and the I don't I don't know people have been following in terms of what the EU came up with, basically doing, I mean I can I mean basically doing nothing. Like what they propose to do is give 5,000 people <laughs> in, in all of Europe um, a, a place in, a, in refugee. Um, and then they continue to have this narrative blaming blaming the people or blaming the governments that they're coming into. And I just know from my own experience working in, you know, in Afghanistan, like, like America and the EU are like selling guns and weapons and, and militarizing that country to the extent that people have to leave, like their lives are really at stake. And then like, and then like making these crazy long journeys, you know, so many people spending months and even years just trying to make it to, to Libya before they even get on a boat um, to come over to Europe. Um, and so many people unaccounted dying, you know, on that, on that trip and then like blaming them, you know, the policy now in the U is like to push, send those people home, you know? Um, uh, and, and I just feel like, like even you know, even watching fucking Katie Hopkins won't call herself a racist, but I, I I feel like we need to say that word and say like what else is that? What else is that policy? What else is that narrative except for like racism? Like not caring at all for the lives of all these people and and you know and I think that it's it's difficult in Ireland to to bring up conversations where you actually call it racism and. Um, because people don't don't want to be called racist. They don't want to think about themselves as being complicit with, within that system. Um, and and you know I've often often heard throughout the years of oh, you know it's not racism, it's xenophobia. We lived in this like homogenous society, um, and people aren't used to having people of color. I kind of think that's a little bit bullshit. Like in the sense of you always had you always had like. Different different kinds of people who were part or not part or not part of the system. I think you know the traveling community is glaring, pierced into that narrative of we've always been all the same. And I, and I'm just getting like kind of worried about going into the next year when when there's like all this rah rah about the the proclamation and people like not naming that as like a really reactionary 
um, Catholic Church driven document, not like this freedom document, and, and, and it's really exclusive of lots of like Irish groups as well as, um, as, as well as migrants. So I think just like really like taking a, like naming it as racism and like thinking about how that trickles into all of these policies and all of these um, ways in which it really hugely, hugely affects people's lives. Either people are dying, literally, or their lives are like very, very much affected by, by racism. And we just call it that and yeah. name it that and start having conversations about like the racism of this mm. society and of Europe. It is, it is, it is, it is racism if, if, if you can decide to, to, to hide a, a, a certain group from society. It is racism. There's no other way you can look at it. The, 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 and we have to keep talking about it, even if people don't want to hear that. The more we say that it is racism, the people will realize it is racism. Until people accept there is racism, it will, racism will always be there. Yeah. Need to accept it, there is racism, then you'll be able to deal with it. Until such happens, people will always be, you know, uh, hide it and, 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 and make things to look a little bit uh, like a glorious type of a thing. But there is an element of racism that starts from there. You can't put one and, and a marginalized group from the other and think this one is a traveler's group, don't belong here. Salam seekers group migration uh, and migrants don't belong here. It is state racism. Yeah. Period. Mm -hmm. Also, I, I think that uh, the way of accepting the labeling could also. I don't know how is is us can also be able to use when we are writing or even in our general way. Because when we talk about even the votes, uh, we, speak, we normally call them. I mean, uh, migrants is four or uh, three have drawn in that instead of even say like people because normally when it yeah. is like people who are going for a holiday they are mentioned as people and not like uh, in, in another way though yeah some, sometimes they could say tourists but, but they will say people three people have okay, been killed so the, the way of i mean uh, language it is it is really it, which, which i found some, sometimes very very uh, tricky in, in the activism uh, uh, a community, you know, like uh, there's a danger of end up uh, adopting a, a very vulgar identity politics, mm -hmm. where I'll say that here, yeah, because I'm, I'm black, so it's only us yeah. who should do this and that. I think uh, in the anti racism network, that was managed to be removed out, you know, that uh, anyone who want to do something, that is a platform. So. Uh, that it, it has to be to be used. I know that some some sometimes it is you uh, it is important when we claim that because I I, I I am an African so I have the right. Because even the media that's that's how they, they do even if I just appear somewhere without even knowing what was going on. But it's to do with Africa they want to interview you but not the people who have organized it, you know if you know it to to, 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 to find your needs. So it is something that maybe we should, uh, I think, it's something I want to hear the views from others. I mean, the danger of vulgar politics, you know, like identity politics, you know, whereby I really want to own it, you know. Uh, which, uh, from onset, when we were dealing about direct provision in the asylum seekers, I refused to see it in a more um, a moral regard. I see it as a political issue whereby it should not be done that. So, I was able, and I'm still able to talk about it with authorities, even if I'm not in it. So it is something that I think he did. I, no, I just thought of it when you when, when were talking about how <coughs> his identity, you know. Yeah. Yeah. We've got about 20, 25 minutes now, so I'm uh, going to just open this out to everybody else. Can you just join in, yeah? Yeah, it's just a couple of comments and questions. Like, uh, 
I suppose like what you were saying about you know recognizing your own privilege, like I've been saying things like you know, uh, uh, you know we're all citizens and like not realizing that you know I was excluding a whole lot of people, but you know in like saying citizens without borders, like you know we're all citizens, like because you're part of society, you're a citizen, like that's just, you know that's the way it is. But um, <coughs> with what you were saying, the different groups that are ho- you know hooking up. Um, like I would, I would like an educational evening. So like it'd be really great if we could get someone from anti-racism ne- network to come in and talk to us. Cause like you were saying, the water charges movement, like um, this it kind of sprung out of that as a way to you know get educated in economics and politics and that. Like, but like we'd also you know obviously like to hook up with other groups and because I was <laughs> I was chatting away to Lucky, I didn't realize he's in direct provision there. Uh, before this, but uh, what I was saying to him was like, you know, uh, what we need is these, all like, like if you could come out and talk to us, and I know you were saying you're finding the water charges campaign difficult, and I can understand that because like um, those same tactics that they're using, you know, to isolate, you know, this section of society and those prejudices are like so deep in the Irish psyche because they've been used against like working class people and poor people for since this inception of the state like we've always had like you know we've always held up like you know a group uh, like a section of society as a warning you know to the rest of society like don't step out of line or you'll end up like that you know so it's kind of the same we've had a lot of practice at pretending that you know we're not prejudiced but obviously you know <laughs> we're massively prejudiced but uh so it's very easy for it to slip into racism as well and um <coughs> Yeah, so just to kind of, I don't know, maybe give you some like explanations <coughs> of why that's so difficult. But like, what I found, like from talking to people, and I do get it in working class communities, like people are more racist, and it's like maybe because I don't know, like finally there's someone for us to look down on. You know what I mean? Like, um, but when you explain it in terms of like, well, you know, like, you know, we were saying it's like a pyramid. There's always someone beneath you that you can look down on, like, and just be like. Or whatever you're saying about whoever is below you, that's exactly what whoever the people who think they're above you, that's what they're saying about you, you know. And like approach you as like we're all human beings, like not like we're all, you know, you're black, you're white, or whatever. Like we're all human beings, and like, but like to you know acknowledge that like these are fellow human beings and we are citizens and we have a responsibility. So you being in direct provision, like that's on my conscience. Do you know what I mean? Like and that's on like that's. Like, that's a lot to ask of people, do you know what I mean? So I think it's getting to the point now where people are just like, okay, you know, enough. You know, we can see the parallels between, like, what what used to happen in Ireland, <coughs> you know, with the modern baby homes and all of that, like, with direct provision, like, you know what I mean? Um, and I think maybe, you know, what we need for the next, like, you know, direct provision events that's going on outside the job is, like, for all the water groups and that to hook up and just turn up as well and the government yeah, be like, what the fuck? And that's only going to happen by, like, I don't know, maybe you come out and give a talk one evening to our group because we'd love to have you out there, you know, so yeah, that's yeah. it. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, just but just to say, uh, this is being recorded. So if anybody wants to, the cameras on these guys the whole time. But if anybody doesn't want their voice recorded, just say before you ask uh, ask the question. So who's next? Yeah. Hi, I have two questions. I'm as a I've been in Ireland for uh, eight or nine months. <coughs> About that, I'm studying at UCD, and what I know, I've, I've been to a lot of the. Um, the, the marches, Irish Water, the um, you know anti-fascist and anti-racist marches, and you mentioned something that really stood out to me: uh, uh, the kind of this nationalist narrative of Irish Water for Irish people. But same thing in the in the in the for yes campaign, uh, mm-hmm. we are this kind of this construction of, of self, of Irish uh, Irish self narrative of progressiveness, mm-hmm. um, because we're Irish, we are progressive, so <laughs> we need to extend certain graces to other people. Mm-hmm. And it's, I, I, find it, I, I found it really problematic, and I was wondering 
what different movements do with these narratives and how, how these are being addressed or not addressed. And uh, I would just like to hear more. So that's one question. And the second is uh, for you. Um, you mentioned a lot about, about the direct provision and the actions you're taking. I was wondering if you, um, to what extent you're looking uh, kind of trans, uh, international or, trans or supranational national initiatives in that sense. Because I'm from the Netherlands and there right, right now there is the We Are Here movement of asylum seekers that uh, have been rejected but cannot be deported and are basically living in the streets now. And there's a lot to do about um, provisions or, or made or not made for them. And they're living in Amsterdam, there are about 200 people who basically go from park to park right now. Um, and But there have been, um, for example, Human Rights Council has really uh, judge the Dutch government for these things and they've been, they've been working the past couple of weeks to come up with, an, with, a, with a solution and there's a lot of pushback against the solution they come up with because they're not insufficient but there is movement in that area so I was wondering how, how you connect with those international uh, or those movements that are going on in other countries if, that, if that's something you're interested in or how you see that so those are my questions but maybe if people want to, because there's a lot, a lot of points to ask by both of you guys. Well, so, yeah. actually, just for the, what you said about the equality team, um, like, yeah, it's almost something, a point you're nearly afraid to raise, but it's like, yeah, okay, it's nearly like a feel-good pre-election thing. It's like, oh, yeah, we can feel really progressive and stuff, but there's still 38% of Irish children living in food poverty. Do you know what I mean? So where's the equality there? You know what I mean? It's like you were saying. We, it's the point we used to try and point out if you're I know, yeah. So do we do we want to ask you guys to respond or will I take more questions for us? Yeah. Yeah, okay. You you want to your question is about us getting uh, involved with the other international uh, if you see connections there, that's Yeah, there is there is uh, we uh, we have met a couple of uh, other organizations as well outside the borders, like in uh, what is the, the, from Australia. Australia. Yeah, we have, have uh, contacts with him, and the, there's an organization in Leeds as well. We have we have met uh, with, with that with that group to have the connections. Uh, and we open to to whatever where we can uh, create those contacts because they, they are there's, there's, there's uh, similarities in what we are we are facing. Uh, it's a European yeah, it's a it's, it's a yeah it's a European problem. So we are open for that. We uh, are not really focusing on what is happening in in, in this land. Yeah. Yeah. Just to add to what you like said, um, I mean, like uh, in the past years, uh, uh, with uh, the groups like Crack, and there was also other groups like Anti Deportation Island, which was also doing and, and complementing that work, which they work together in most of these activities. They've, all, they've managed and they've been able to get this information, uh, sharing information, especially on deportation, because before they used to be like, um, Frontex flight, which was uh, going from country to country picking people. So that was that's how information was being shared. And uh, yeah, it's it's like European problem more when it comes to deportation in Ireland. Though the way of um, keeping asylum seekers different is different from country to country. But uh, as you've seen in the past days in Brussels they always meet together and see how, how, how do they do. Yeah, so Crack and other organizations, they put links around uh, Europe and outside Europe, you say that like in Australia, uh, the Manas, you know, those uh, small islands where Australia is putting its, um, I mean, the uh, asylum seekers in that. So that shelf, shelf, shelf information is helping among among the, the groups here and activists. Mm -hmm. And it's not only the activists, even some acad acad uh, academics that also uh, work when they're working there, when they meet like uh, when they're interviewing or doing their, their research, 
they also link with other groups and all that. So it is it is being done. Yeah. So we've got maybe 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, just to take up the earlier points because uh, I think it's completely right that uh, there are many uh, sentiments and opinions expressed in the media and even not even just in the media by people at large. Uh, which are in fact racist, but aren't acknowledged as being racist, then of course everyone is probably now aware of the whole Katie Hopkins thing. And I'd actually go even further, uh, having read that article, it's not just racist. I, I know the word is overused and used where it shouldn't be, but it's outright fascist, the kind of sentiments she expressed. It, it's beyond just that us and them siege mentality. It really does delve into yeah. kind of the most extreme forms of prejudice against the against what you see as your in group. Uh, uh, I, I think another important thing uh, to you know call out as racist that isn't normally acknowledged as racist, uh, especially because it, it actually occurs in many progressive movements, uh, more on the center left than on like what we would be on the left. But uh, in terms of the religion of Islam, like people from the global south from. Muslim majority countries who emigrate to the global north, and uh, when someone again, I just to take again Katie Hopkins complaining about raising the Pakistani flag uh, above a neighborhood to celebrate Pakistan Day, saying you're supporting child molesters, you know that kind of uh, that, and people will always say, oh, that's not racist because Islam isn't a race. Well, actually. In the global north, at least, the religion of Islam is tied up to a certain set of ethnicities. So you can't. Re I mean, Rita Ora, the British singer, is uh, an Albanian Muslim, but you won't see that kind of thing against her because of her appearance. So it is, in fact, at least in this part of the world, tied up uh, to race. So you, to, it is, in fact, legitimate, I would say, to call that kind of behavior racist, even though it normally. So I guess just to ask everybody, are there? That included, are there any other things you think should be called out as as legitimately racist that aren't acknowledged as being such? I've been, <coughs> sorry, I've been looking such kind of uh, platforms, you know, because I I am here for the past seven years, and even though I'm an additional, but still, wherever you go, there are lots of places where you've been discriminated on the basis of your religion, on the basis of your color. I have a little daughter, she's four years. I've been trying to get her into a school for the past, I would say, six months. I've applied in 10 schools. They all have given me the reasons. It's like, do you have a sibling here? Do you have a pupil somebody teaching here? Is she a Catholic? Yes. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I, I completely lost it, you know. So I, I had a big argument with one of the good school principals, and she had that. Uh, they said to say to me that, oh, this is a Catholic school. Mm. And I said, is it her, uh, I mean, is it her fault that she's born to a Hindu family? And where will she go? She's born here, she's in born Irish here. She can't go to India to study. Mm. So where, where, where will she go? Oh, I can't help it. And then she's telling that there is a law which says that they can prioritize Catholics. Yeah, I wrote to the uh, minister, I wrote to the two, three ministers and from all the places the reply got is, oh, we are bringing up a new education policy soon. So I don't know what will happen to that. So this, this kind of platform, you know, we should bring out our voices, you know, because like I've been fighting it all along yeah. with few friends, you know, going here, yeah, going yeah. there, of course. Yeah. Okay, somebody support, somebody support. It was good on the part of Solidarity Media that there was an Indian student who was attacked, and I wrote to them, and then immediately they put up on their page. And with the same uh, this issue of the admission, I have approached uh, Joe Duffy, I have approached uh, quite a few media, but. Initially, they responded, oh, yeah, 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 we will we'll bring it up, we'll bring it up. And after that, I've written mails, mails, calls, oh, yeah, we'll come back to you, we'll come back to you. They all are kind of silent. They're, they're scared. Mm. They're scared. Yeah, and you see, and public perception and reaction, yeah. what will it be? Yeah? Mm. Just in relation to that, another kind of examples, you know, and I don't think us <coughs> to kind of go on that level of us isolated, uh, you know, incidents, you know. We have prisons where people with no convictions kind of, you know, uh, mm. kind of, you know, sitting there, you know. We have immigrants, you know, who kind of 
uh, cannot uh, uh, go to schools, cannot have uh, and, uh, and, and that kind of language which I almost like internalized towards me, I supposed to be grateful because I'm here, I supposed to be grateful for having that services, you said good services, as if, you know, I'm not actually allowed to kind of go my way, we have to, I, I, I kind of actually uh, for a while internalized of that apologetic, you know, mm -hmm. kind of uh, yeah. attitudes towards myself. And everybody, because of my accent, yeah, I'm privileged because of my skin color, so I'm not easy, as easily recognized as, you know, not one of us. But I kind of, when I opened my mouth, you know, I kind of was interrogated by, you know, member of public, members of public, you know, uh, 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 and do you work here, and do you, what do you do here? That constant self-explanation, <laughs> you know, self, you know, gonna, you know, that's what we experience. And yet, when you bring these issues up, there is that awkwardness. Even in this room, I feel it. You know, we need to kind of face the problem. You know, the society is deeply racist, deeply prejudiced. Yeah. It's ingrained in our system. You know, it's not just bad citizens. You know, who no, kind no, of yeah, it's yeah. practiced practice daily, you know, so in terms of radicalism, you know, that, that kind of, I was four years undocumented, you know, and you know, I have privilege of free time, and I decided I'm not going to accept it anymore as a norm, that's scary, I was sobbing uncontrollably when we actually commemorate this uh, lost uh, lives, you know, uh, but invisibility that what strikes me, you know, mm -hmm. or, you know, okay guys, you fight for yourself, we, we listen kind of here, you know, with that polite kind of faces and saying, yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're okay, you know guys, yeah, you struggle over there, <laughs> we're yeah, here. Yeah. We need to kind of seriously bring these issues, you know, of uh, supporting each other and, but first of all, we need to kind of call it as it is, you know, it's it's unbelievable. You it's know. Catholic. We, we, we cannot talk about you know, and we stop. We need to stop uh, justifying it because of my past, you know, because of my this. You know, I came from Russian culture, and it is a deeply racist culture. But I I, I should stop, you know, saying because of that, you know, mm. not anymore. Because yeah. until I kind of say no more on my watch, you yeah. know, stop it, you yeah. know. I'm I completely mean. supporting it. ourselves, you know, what I see, what, what inspires me beyond, you know, guys, that, you know, to, to, to say no to it, no matter where uh, I am, no matter kind of how um, unprivileged I am at the moment, you know, I still have the choice, but the system is unbelievably kind of uh, 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 corrupt in that respect and uh, we need to kind of eject it and build up something from looking up to the side. Yeah. 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 Uh, my name is Claudine and I am a member of uh, an organization called Attack Ireland. I feel that the problem of the rise of racism and of racist movements uh, it's not just Irish, it's European. We've seen it in Greece, we see it in France, we see it in the UK. And I really think that the powers that be have a huge responsibility in it. They find in it the excuse, for instance, for saying we cannot take in more immigrants because otherwise the population is going to object. But I think that the policies of austerity have really contributed to the rise of racism. There are people, not just in Ireland, in France, everywhere, there are people who are dreading losing their home or have already lost it. There are people who are working on short-term contracts, on zero-hour contracts. There are people who need 
health services and cannot access them. I have a friend at the moment who is in hospital. I spent the whole morning with his wife discussing why he could not be operated until it had become an emergency. And even now, they've only just checked the emergency and not actually treated the underlying problem. I, I think they probably died before they actually treat the problem. He's Irish, he's white. There are people, and Irish people, who cannot send their children to a school because they're not Catholic. It's not just you. There are Irish people who actually go on and have a pretend baptism to be able to get their children into school. There are people whose children have special needs and they cannot get help for it. Now, a lot of those people are just scared. They are scared in Ireland, they're scared in France, they're scared in Germany, they're scared everywhere. They are so afraid because they have so little. And the few services that they still have, they are told there is no money to provide you with those services. And then they see boat fulls of migrants. Now, if they saw a plane full of rich Arab sheep landing in London, they would not feel any racism. They would say that's great for business, they're going to bring in money, etc. Et if they saw a, a plane full of African dictators with them, their pockets full of money landing in France, they would say that's Sorry. great, they yeah. would spend money here. But they are scared because they see there's nothing. We keep being told there's nothing here. Yeah. And we have to share? Well, share so what? We're, we're, yeah. not, we're, here, we're not scared. That's why we're here. Like, no, I do know. And she's even she's like, about I know, citizens. but what I am saying is that the governments are telling the people there's no money. And what I'm saying as well is it's not true that there's no money. We've bailed out the banks. Yeah, we yeah. have spent money, loads of money, billions, to bail out rich banks, to bail out shareholders. We have the money. Why is that money not distributed more fairly? And we have the money to give decent accommodation to people. We have the money to, to give health care. We have the money to give education. It is just that we have chosen to share the money in a certain way. That's why I think it's linked but, up yeah, to I, movement. I, I, I think that's it. What, I, what I was watching in the past <laughs> months about water charges, I didn't see in fear because the guards have been deployed across the country, in the yeah. communities. People are organizing, not only at national, but in the community, you know? And some have been taken to courts, not only in Dublin, in Galway and other cities. So there's no real fear. Sometimes it is that the narration, how do we tell the story again? If we say it in the way of how those who are in, in power are saying it, Yes, there's fear. It will go away. But if we say from what we are hearing, how they're organizing, in most difficult circumstances in direct provision, where indeed they come and pick you in the middle of night or during the day and deport you, but they're organizing, there's no fear. There's so much hope and also there's, that's why we, we are trying to say even here that we should not accept that hype that they are all much powerful, they are all that, and they, there's, there's no alternative or they cannot do this. There's so much we can do if we will come together and do something, and each and everyone, if they are participating on their own, than to think, as you have seen, that how much work you were doing on your, on your own and others, and imagine how with other groups, you know, if, if you join other uh, campaigning groups in that, or even form with others those groups, how much it could it, it could do. The thing is to see those small dots and join them together to, to broaden the struggle, which will which will bring me to what you were saying about the nationalistic, like which groups are really really challenging that narration and that. You can see that all the mainstream political parties, they also want to claim that base of nationalistic, that's where the problem is. And most organizations at the end, they will become more electoral about going to parliament or about contesting elections. So they won't be able to really challenge all these things because of, of fear, in, in my opinion. I think it's something that someone has to really prove to me on why they can't really tackle real issues, that real 
other people are facing than only like you congested on, on some of the more economic issues which will bring votes. And that's why like these platforms and, and, and the social movements that uh, come together and uh, means uh, come to this type of uh, uh, platforms try to see and make people that the point of everything we do is just to get organized. Mm -hmm. We need to get organized at every level, every chance we get. Yeah. Okay. We, we, do we have time for one, two questions? No, we have to finish now. But uh, I just want to say we have to finish now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess because people have been saying, you know, t that we should get involved and talk to each other and maybe plan this, but maybe if people could just leave their name and email if they do want. I mean, I'm with Anti Racism Network and, and so are Luke and Farah, but just it's a good contact point anyway if people do want to because there's a lot of issues that just aren't being represented. You're talking about Farah, you're talking about Abby, and I'm with yours as well, with Louise, all the rest of it. So I'm just, if you could, might just. And that's the best way. Yeah, that's the best best way to, to learn about the different struggles and to be in solidarity with people is just coming and supporting what migrant self-organizing folks like Aaron are doing. I think that's that's really and you know please sign up and there's so much we can do. Next action, you know, these people want to support you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and yeah, you can sign up and you can find out about all of our actions and everything that we're doing. And with other organizations as well. Yeah, guys, so don't forget to, to drop in change if we go out. Thank you very much for our table.